community of psychotherapists, not just in England, but in my travels. Um, I've spoken about it in many places. And so I am very pleased to be able to give something back to the way that they have hosted me over the years. Um, I'm not going to speak really directly to the topic about how we make monsters, because I want to situate that within a larger context of two questions, um, actually three questions that then are followed by these two. So as I was thinking about what I was gonna do, the first thing that came to me was uh, I'm really looking back, not just for this talk tonight, but um, for other talks that I've done recently, um, looking back on 51 years of being in service uh, to the psyche, both as a psychotherapist, as a writer, a teacher. Um, and so in that backward glance, I thought the best thing I could do would be to open up the title of the talk in a way. And in looking back, frame the question that I really want to address tonight in the following way. First of all, we are living in a world that is totally changed in many ways, even before COVID-19. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But I think over the past uh, 20 years, at least for me, um, a question that has ar arisen is, uh, is psychotherapy still a viable um, form of practice today? And I mean that in the general sense. And then as I thought about that question, uh, I realized that to answer it and to, to give my remarks tonight, I really have in mind two aspects of that question. I think I've been about the work of the last 20 years, or maybe more, maybe the last 30, of really thinking about the question, where is the therapy room, particularly today? What are its boundaries? Where do we find it? Where is that container? You know, if you think about alchemy, where, where the work, the work that we do as therapists, where does that take place? Where do we find it? And then secondly, what is the work of therapy today? Today, in this pandemic world that we're living in, where ecological crises, political upheavals, economic insecurity, racial injustice, um, gender issues, where all of these things and the institutions that support them are coming to an end, breaking down in some way. And what's gonna break through? So that's, I'd like you to keep those two questions in mind. And the way I'd like to begin is to tell a story. as a reply to the two questions and as a way of amplifying it. This story is about one of your great British actors, Anthony Hopkins, who in the, I think, late uh, 80s or so, maybe the early 90s, I'm not sure, but somewhere in there in the 80s, he uh, was preparing for the role to play Pablo Picasso. And I saw an interview with him, or read an interview with him in the LA Times. And in the interview, this great actor said that he was, as they were getting ready to start shooting, he felt he couldn't do it. He had watched recordings of Picasso. He had read biographies. He had talked with people who knew Picasso. And he said, I just wasn't coming and I didn't know if I could play Pablo Picasso. And he says the most remarkable thing in the interview. 
He said, then one morning, after a sleepless night again, as I was walking down the stairs to breakfast, as I was walking down the stairs to my breakfast, I became Picasso. I found that extraordinary. And it started me thinking about what's implied in his statement. And I realized that for someone like Anthony Hopkins or for anyone who is more than just a star, a movie star, but a really good actor, what happens on stage is that the person of the actor fades away into the character being displayed and embodied on stage. It's like a metamorphosis. And then I began to wonder about what am I doing as a psychotherapist? And I began to see that maybe I should begin to think about what is psychotherapy from that perspective. I had had some mm, rough ideas out of my training in existential phenomenology and Freudian, Jungian depth psychology and the offshoots of, of their work, Jungian's work, for example. But I suddenly began to see that what I had been looking for, what my experience was in the therapy room was something very similar to what Anthony Hopkins said. So over the years, I honed this insight that I'm about to speak about. I would teach it to my clinical students at Pacifica, the 20 or some odd years that I taught there. And it was this insight that I would tell them, because this was my experience, do not identify the person who comes to therapy for the figures or the characters who come for therapy. And I said to my students, and I, I actually experienced it that way myself in the years that I had been in analysis, that the person who comes to therapy brings in the figures who come to tell their tales, to tell their untold stories. And that'll get us into the question about margins and monsters in a minute. But it raised an issue, really. We could see the character displayed and performed on stage. That's very clear. You don't see so much Anthony Hopkins. He makes Picasso come alive, or one of my favorite all-time plays has been Death of a Salesman. And for my 65th birthday, my wife got me the last two seats front row in the theater in New York for Philip Seymour Hoffman's portrayal of Willie Loman. And it was magical because there's another great actor. His first entrance on stage is Willie Loman. But you see him. But what about the figures or the characters who come to tell their tale? Where are they? Their habitat, where they dwell, are in their symptoms. So we're building down into the questions that I'm raising here. So I'm going, I'm preparing the ground to answer and reply to those questions. They're in the symptoms. And that meant that I was really working with a different sense as a psychotherapist what is a symptom? And I had had a sense, particularly in my own life and dealing with my own um, symptoms and shadows, I came to understand that the symptom is primarily a vocation, a calling, not something to be cured, not something to be medicalized away, not something to be disregarded, but to attend to. A vocation. And as a vocation, it is a tension between remembering something in your life, in one's life, that is too vital to forget, but forgetting it because it's too painful or inconvenient to remember. 
So it's a vocation with that double-edged sword to it, remembering and forgetting. And here it would be good to give a simple example of what I mean, because that will take us into the territory about margins and body. Many years ago, although this is not the only example, clinical example I could give. Oh, I meant to shut this off, sorry. Many years ago, um, when I worked at the counseling center at the University of Pittsburgh, I was the long man for psychotherapy because I was the one that was trained uh, in the tradition, not just of counseling, but uh, technology and depth psychology. So I would get these more quote, difficult students. And this young girl came into my office she was referred by the counseling center, actually had to come. It was uh, her first year, her first semester, away from a small town family, and uh, she was not doing well. As the semester went on, she stopped eating, she stopped attending classes, and then she began to uh, disturb not just her roommate, but the other people in the dormitory. So she came in and I can still remember, you know how sometimes the people that you've seen, even going back 30, 40 years, they're, they're vivid. And uh, because of that, I have to sort of check in with myself as I've done whether I can present her here because even in her absence, she becomes present. But she was, unkempt, quite disheveled, hair uncombed, um, clothes kind of this or that. And she was quiet, very, very quiet. I would get grunts or one or two word answers and it was not going anywhere. I guess we limped along like that twice a week and uh, I just stayed, just stayed. But something told me that you just stayed. What like, is that? This was way before I began thinking about persons and figures. I noticed, and I'm going to exaggerate it here, that she would do a gesture. And I'm going to exaggerate it because it was so subtle that it took me a while to pick it up. She would go like this. As if she was on a rocking chair, but very subtle. And I didn't say anything to her. I just waited and wondered. She wasn't saying much, but what she was saying wasn't revealing much. What about that gesture? Was there something in that gesture? It was odd to say the least, even though it was subtle. So I waited. And then one day I'm sitting with her and I hear a baby crying. Now, for those of you who really practice out of a Jungian archetypal perspective, that always raises a question. Am I projecting something? Is there something in the field between us? I get it as an image. And what do you do with that image? Well, I know enough now, and I knew enough then, you just don't blurt it out. So I waited and I carefully said one day while she was going like that, I said, uh, I hear a baby crying. Do you hear the baby? And this was unbelievable. She suddenly broke down in a cascade of tears, flooded with tears. She couldn't breathe. You know how when a child is being uh, reprimanded and uh, trying to talk, uh, uh, they can't get the words out. That's, she was like that, like gasping for breath and this cascade of tears. So I waited to calm down. 
And when she stopped, I said, can you tell me what you saw or what you felt? And she told me the most incredible story. She was raised by a grandmother because her mother had been hospitalized as a schizophrenic and her mother, grandmother wasn't much beyond that. But the grandmother thought that the best way to educate a child, her, and to teach her the right and proper way to be, she would strap her in a rocking chair. And she would say to her, now you're gonna be a good girl, you're not gonna do that anymore. And she would hit her in the head until the girl would say something. And of course she couldn't, she would start crying. That was incredible. What that told me then was that a history, a trauma, uh, expressed itself and carried itself and lingered on the margins of mind in the body, in the symptom that she presented, the depression, the uh, decompensation, and all of that. Uh, one minute. That light over there is wrong. Wrong. So I began then on the basis of that and other examples, uh, and in the background of that story about Anthony Hopkins, I began to, to think of psychotherapy in a different way. I began to think of psychotherapy as the transformation of ordinary space, the space that we live outside and we cross the threshold into a different space that is a place so psychotherapy is the transformation of a space into a place where the figures who linger in the shadows on the margins of mind, where they linger and come to tell their stories in the embodied gestural field between the therapist and the patient. So I began to see that therapy really is like theater, that we're witnessing an importance, but, but the task of the therapist is to attune himself or herself to the way in which the characters are both revealing and concealing themselves in the gestures, in the tone of voice, in the different registers, even I began to be able to see with patients in terms of how they dress for this session. And then maybe two weeks later, some mark changed in either direction. That was very, very clear for a, to me for a, a woman I worked with who had been really terribly abused as a child. When she first came in, she was like a doll, perfect, not a hair out of place. But as we got closer and closer, where she was recovering some memories of the sexual trauma, she came in and she got more and more disheveled. So there's something in the way in which the person who comes to therapy brings the figures across the threshold and they live in that gestural field that I just tried to describe. It also changed then that way of thinking about therapy, the way I work with dreams but I don't have time to go into that now. But I did move from starting with interpreting a dream to being with the dream through enactment and embodiment. And there are a couple of essays on my website if you wanna look at that. Um, I forget the title of them, but you'll be able to, to figure out which ones. But essentially I'm not throwing away interpretation. But I'm saying the first move has to be to stay with the dream in terms of where it lives in and through and with the body. And I worked out a series of steps to be able to do that. So where then, back to our questions, where is the therapy room? Well, it's in that space that is a place 
marked by a threshold where the world and its suffering comes in with the person of the patient to live out stories in the figures who come to tell their tales. Psyche is not inside us, it belongs to the world. John Keats, one of your great English poets says, let's call the world or call the world if you please, the veil of soul making. Um, and of course that was my training in phenomenology. Um, it starts with the notion of the person as a being in the world. But that world today, that world that where the patients cross the threshold is um, very much slowly, but almost every day more and more becoming a digital world. We live more in digital space now than we do in the face-to-face -face encounter. We're doing this right now. And I'm not making a judgment about that. All I'm saying is that in the world that we live in today, this possibility is necessary and valuable. But for me, the danger is, or the crisis that uh, this technology uh, brings with it, with its own story, is that we will slowly begin to forget what we are losing when we leave the body behind. I'm not making a judgment about whether therapy in digital space or face-to-face -face is good or bad, I'm not doing that. I'm asking a more fundamental question. As we become more and more used to it, is the danger that we will begin to take that so, uh, easily as a new normal that we will begin to forget what we're leaving behind in our face-to-face -face encounter. Not only that, but as we become more adapted to it and even beguiled by its possibilities, will we forget that we have even forgotten and fall into a double amnesia? That's a question for me about technology really. Um, and has been at the core of my work. But for the moment, let me just add that um, I have thought somewhat about this issue, about what's the difference and what do we leave behind, uh, the difference between therapy in the digital room, the digital space, and in the face-to-face. -face. It's really one thing we leave behind. If we go back to that story about the rocking chair girl and the Anthony Hopkins story, what we leave behind is the gestural feel of embodiment where we communicate, we impregnate each other with meaning through our gestures. A smile, a tilt of the head, a wave of the hand. We can't do that or we don't pick that up as much because we're, we're an image, an image with uh, the sound, et cetera. But maybe I can make it clearer by saying um, it's in the digital space, we can't kiss each other. And why does that matter? Well, think about the poet E.E. E. Cummings. He who knows only the syntax of things, the meaning of things, will never wholly kiss you. And maybe we lose something when we lose that need, that hunger, that desire for this erotic embodied connection. We even see that in COVID-19. People are now suffering from, and I'm not surprised, what is called COVID fatigue. It's as if this sense of not being with others strikes at something very fundamental about what it means to be an embodied human being. So that, that leads me then to what is the work of therapy? Saying where it is. It's in the world, in that space, that when you cross the threshold becomes that place for the figures to tell their story. What is the work of the therapist? I would say the work of the therapist then in paying attention to the figures who come to tell their story, who live in the symptoms, who are invisible, that is, they're not as 
visibly present as the actor on stage, but they're in the symptoms, like I indicated with that example, that it's marginal work then. To do this kind of work, to attend to the figures who come to tell their tale, you have to go to the margins. And what do you find on the margins? Those untold tales. That young lady was monstrous to her roommate. That young lady was monstrous to the people on her floor. She suffered that and became more and more monstrous in the isolation. In therapy, one has to lean into those margins. So it's marginal work. But it's also lower education, a phrase that Mary Smell has, which uh, I envy. <laughs> I wish I had come up with that. Lower education, because it's an education in attending to the lowering of conscious mind into the body. The body never lies. So if a person is telling you something, you could read the unsaid in what is being said in the way the body is expressing itself. So what is the work of therapy? It's to go into the spirit of the depths that exists in the spirit of the times, to attend to the figures on the margin and to attend to that lower form of education that begins to help the patient's marginal figures, monstrous as they may be, to others and even to themselves in their suffering because people do suffer with what is pushed aside, forgotten, with the symptom that is too painful to remember, but too vital to forget. They suffer that. We all do one way or another. And so the spirit of the times comes through that across that threshold and we pay attention to the margins and to the embodied relationship where those figures express and display themselves, we pay attention to that. And in doing so, we attend to the spirit of the depths. And that's an important distinction that Jung made. And one that I followed up in reading literature, that's the way I read the Frankenstein book. It's what Jung calls a visionary work, where the spirit of the depths is present today in the spirit of the times when Mary Shelley wrote it. I won't have time to say too much of that, uh, so uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But in addition to um, marginal work, uh, it is a work of anamnesis, which is Plato's word, out of amnesia. So anamnesis means unforgetting. But I use that word because it's more than just, oh, I remember something. No, it's the labor of unforgetting something that doesn't want to or resist being remembered because it's too painful to remember it. And it works in the art of therapy. I mean, if you think about this for a minute, I don't think the, the skill of the therapist has anything to do with being clever with his or her interpretations. It's the subtle art of the Socratic method to be able to question by attentive listening to what is being unsaid or to what is being expressed by the figure rather than the person. It is the training that actors go through and learning how to become the character that they're gonna display. And then finally, so it's marginal work, it's uh, lower education, it's the work of unforgetting, which then is a work of remembering, but hyphen, which means that with the art of questioning in therapy, and you all know this, if you are really serving, not just the adjustment of the person, but the figures who come to tell their story, mindful that not everybody can be dealt with it in that way. I'm not saying you should impose that. There have been some patients that I've had where it was very clear that I just had to help the person make the next move. And I couldn't deal with the figures. I have some very good examples of that, but it's no time to go into that here. So it's an amnesis, a remembering, which is a dismembering, and then to be remembered, 
reminded, put back together in another way, which opens the possibility of the imagination. And then finally, I would say, if you do all of that, you attend to what's on the margins, to the monsters that we make and that are made and are growing up in community with others and family, etc. If you're black in America, you've been treated to a whole history of how you are demonized. And so something's rising up from the margins out there in the world now, a kind of theater therapy, Black Lives Matter, um, the, uh, the, the protest about greed, the Wall Street movement, protest about that. Things are happening on the margins. The rise of young people about climate change. Therapy is taking place out there in the streets. And when you do this work, psychotherapy then becomes a work of coming home. And I truly believe that. Psychotherapy and my time of being in therapy has been a homecoming, but it is a homecoming on the levels, different levels of the unconscious. You come home to your own complexes. That's hard work, your own shadows. On the cultural historical level, coming home to uh, those aspects of our culture and history, which have been forces of oppression. Uh, and that is where a lot of my work has been centered on technology and its shadows. And uh, from my book on technology, A Symptom and Dream to the Frankenstein Prophecy, which is formatted as questions. And so it's told from that point of view and it raises questions so that the reader is asked like in a therapy session, to think about the shadows of technology through the story of Victor Frankenstein and his monster. And then there's the collective archetypal level, the larger stories. And I have always felt that what has always really been most therapeutic for me is when I can help someone who is suffering to find the larger story of which theirs is a part. We belong then to something in the human condition. And then finally, with Jung and his work with physicists, the psychoid level, where psyche is nature and nature is psyche. And, you know, when a person comes in, for example, with depression, I try to listen to what's on the margin at four levels. What has been silenced in their family life about them? What else comes into the room with them? I mean, it's insane in a way to treat a person's depression today as if it's just a private matter. It's rather insane when people are really suffering the death of the planet. So to end on that note, I would like to do, if I have time, invite you all to a little exercise. And I think this will take just a very few minutes and I should, if I have 40 minutes, I should be able to do this. So stay with me. I have to pull it up. So I have to get out of this. I don't want to, wait a minute. How do I get out of exit full screen? Nope, hope. Okay. In the context of all that I've spoken about, my sense is that today, one of the figures or one of the stories that come in that are asking to be told is the death of nature. We are living at a moment in human history where we are faced with singular override, a singular overriding question. How much time might we have left on the planet? Even at the peak of the nuclear crisis in the 1980s, which seems to have gone underground a little bit, when the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists set the doomsday clock at two minutes to midnight, there was still some sense that species side would not be allowed to happen, that we would pull away from the brink of our own self-destruction and the destruction of nature 
that the path toward a nuclear winter was not irreversible. But recently, within the last few months, the clock has been advanced to 100 seconds before midnight. Our ability to reverse global warming and its consequences is now more in question, even perhaps our ability to slow the process down. And so here's an exercise, an invitation to have an experience that I'd like to end with. To bear witness the climate catastrophe from the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths by staying with those hundred seconds. When that doomsday clock was set to two minutes to midnight or to a hundred seconds to midnight, that's the closest we have ever been to this mark since the clock was created in 1947. Midnight is the moment when the annihilation of the human species and the destruction of nature as we know it might happen. That seems unthinkable, unimaginable. And if you regard that, no, we just, uh, everything is too big. Huh? That, that's just unimaginable. But suppose we bring it down to size, to feel it in our bodies, in our psyches, in our souls. When the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima 75 years ago, how many seconds did those living in the city have left in their lives before the annihilation? Whatever the number of seconds they had, they did not know how much time they had left. But we do. We have 100 seconds to midnight. What does 100 seconds to live feel like? Let us imagine it now together. For 100 seconds, let us stay in the unthinkable. For 100 seconds. Just to be quiet and stay with that. Okay, for 100 seconds, we have tried to stay with the felt sense of that possibility. If you stay with that and the alarm goes off, like it just did for iPhone, What do we do? Do not ask for whom the clock ticks. It ticks for you and for me and for all of us. 
Do not ask for whom the alarm is sounding. It is tolling for you and me and all of us and all the billion animals that were burned in the Australian fires, for the dying forest and polluted waters, and for all that each of us and those whom we know and love have ever been and still might be. The doomsday clock is a mirror that reflects back to us a disturbing image of the so-called new normal that is a measure of our collective insanity, this way we're going about, the shadows of technology to destroy nature. How have we arrived at this point? How does it affect the psyche, not just of the individual, but of the collective, the community at the archetypal level? And how does that affect our work as a therapist? How do we respond when the alarm wakes us from sleep? I want to stop there. Thank you very much. Woo. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm feeling quite stunned, to be honest. Um, as you began to speak that, the, the visceral sense of terror. Um, was really powerful and I found it hard to stay with. I was looking to see if anyone was posting a question. This is really difficult to stay with. And there was a sort of paradoxical relief in the end when the alarm went off. I'll take a bit longer. Um, sorry, somebody else has just come on screen. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I was slightly distracted there. My screen changed. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really, I'm really with that experience. I'm wondering if other people have, yes, okay. So I've got one question here. What is the role of personal therapy where the source of the depression isn't a private matter? Well, that's, that's, that's the question that I tried to address. I don't think today you can deal with anyone's depression without dealing with all of the four registers where we forget the cultural historical, the collective, and where we are part of nature and nature is part of us. Um, and so to deal, it, it, it seems to me now that at all of these levels, the predominant story that I feel is being brought in through the shadow of technology, um, which is why I try to say that also in writing the Frankenstein book, is an undertone of anxiety and grief. And so what, what we are being asked to do is to stay with what the person who is suffering from depression to stay with that feeling, with that suffering, and to try and uncover in that the profound sense of sorrow. Because oftentimes in our culture today, we distract ourselves from it. I think one of the things that is so difficult for us, all of us to deal with today in the kind of fast paced world we live in is to slow down enough and to say, yeah, I feel real sorrow. I feel that, I mean, how many of us feel the sense that, you know, you might never see the loved ones that you know and that you can't get to again because of lockdown. I mean, I feel that in being unable to get back to the States. So that's just one example. So if a person comes in and it's not personal grief, I would really open a space for paying attention to what else they're bringing in, who are the figures who are telling the story, look at the gestures, pay attention to their dreams, look at those moments when something gets frozen perhaps in their posture, or in the cramped gesture, or in the strangled word. And I would make a space through judicious questioning to try and bring the possibility that their grief is larger than their own personal suffering. And that can be really therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, yeah. Thank it's you. The best I can do with that question. <laughs> Thank you. I was really struck by your um, when you were speaking about things like the the protest of the Black Lives Matter movement, the the, the kind of uprising of collective energy and, and kind of the activation and through protest and you use the phrase theater um, and I I suppose that I'm curious about is um, how do we as therapists support the process where that the gestures of that protest can be may can be formulated as thought and and expression so that they can the meaning of them can be thought about rather than the discharge of action i'm just kind of wondering where the role of therapy is in 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 that work that's a really good question because it, it would seem as if well you know you have the luxury of kind of being a privileged white male you can sit in your office, you, you know, people could come in, you could talk about their dreams and you gotta be out there on the streets, you know? You've got to be protesting. And my answer to that is that there are many ways to protest. And one of those ways is to really open that space where you can pause for a minute being caught up in the spirit of the times to reflect on what's happening and then by paying attention to the patients who come in with their suffering, paying attention to their dreams and your own dreams to see that kind of work as a form of activism because you change your consciousness. And then maybe it's like a pebble dropped in the pond, but then we gotta do something more. And I think therapists today have to try and do that on the larger cultural historical level. So I'm working on a blog. I'm not sure yet whether I want to publish it, um, but I've got 16 blogs about COVID-19. And in one of the blogs, I talk about when George uh, was it Foster, I think it was, when the policeman knelt on his neck do any of you remember that? And he said, a black man, he said, I can't breathe. Do not ask for whom he was speaking. He's speaking for all of us. And so in our writing, in doing these, these kinds of webinars, we have to bring the special skill that we have as therapists to be able to step back and look at the symptomatic side of what's going on and bring our special talents to that form of action, to deepen the experience into the depths. I think he was expressing for all of us, not just people who are oppressed because of their color or their gender or their economic insecurities, but because in many ways, the way the technology now in a 24 seven fast paced world leaves us no time to catch our breath. And what are we losing? So that would be my answer too, is to really hone what you do as a therapist, to open up a little space to pause, to reflect, and to bring the symptomatic side to what we see happening. Does that mean that we don't go out and protest? Not in the least. I mean, that's where, you know, that, that's where, that's what happened to me. Uh, in the 60s, I protested the Vietnam War and I wrote my doctoral dissertation on racism. But I realized somewhere along the way that, that those protests also had to be fit with the temperament that I have to try and bring that larger picture, another way of looking at the thing, and to share that. I would answer that question. Thank you. I've got a, a comment um, from Celia that her experience with the exercise was the, the feeling there was no point in trying to reach out to anyone, that time was so short. The only thing to do was to be with the here and now, nothing more. Um, mm. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. 
and I, I don't, I'm not saying this was Celia's experience, but just thinking about one of the challenges around the climate emergency is, is the sense of paralysis that it's too late, that there's nothing more to be done. I wonder if you have anything to say to that. I know that feeling. I mean, I, I wake up with that a lot in my own life. But to me, the, the power of the exercise is that we know if we follow what the atomic scientists are saying about 100 seconds to midnight, it's a metaphor. Yeah. But that midnight could very well be the eradication of large swaths of this planet and mm -hmm. the life. And we've already seen that in Australian bush by a million animals burned. I mean, the, the storms, the hurricanes in California, the fires. When do we wake up? So I try to use that exercise to say what we have is that little piece of knowledge, a hundred seconds, what would you do with any second that you have? Because no one knows how much time they have. No one has promised even the next second. So I understand, is it Celia who raised that question? I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. And I feel that too. But at the same time, for me, there is also the other possibility. What am I going to do with the second or the hundred seconds or the year that I have left? And I agree with what she said. To stay in the moment right now and to be present as fully as possible to whatever this moment brings me. Because it's out of the present that any work about remembering and imagining new possibilities begins. My situation now. So I see it as a gift that we have this, you know, I mean, if somebody would have come up to you and said, look, you've got one year to live. Yeah, that could paralyze you. But then what do you do with that one year? You've got a gift that you don't have usually. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I was trying to say, but I, 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 I'm not setting myself up as some sort of prophet here. I suffer the same things. For me, I'll tell you, serious, I get up every morning and I have to do my physical exercises at nearly 78 because my body wants to, you know, but also my psyche. I have to really deal with, okay, what is the news bringing today? And what am I being, what, what am I being asked to do? So. Okay. So I've got a couple of um, kind of, Question from Charlene around how uh, the fact that when clients come into the room at the moment with fear, there's actually a, a profound and genuine reason to be fearful, mm. um, whether that's the risk of infection and COVID or, or the climate crisis or the disintegration of society and the fact that the food supply chain is all going to be ruptured come the 31st of December. And it's like, it, there's something about how do we actually sit in the room with the client when the fear isn't a neurosis it's it's kind of objective and there's a lot to be frightened about and about how do we sit in that space therapeutically with that that's why i wanted to expand my talk tonight in terms of the stories that i told about the patient mm -hmm. and anthony hopkins person figure etc spirit of the time spirit of the depths no i I don't deal with, with it as a neurosis anymore in the sense of this is my suffering. Mm. Um, I am suffering on the personal level, but there is also a collective and a cultural historical level to my fear. And one, if one is not afraid, then I'd be more concerned about that. So I'd stay with the fear and say, okay, what are the images in your fear? Because if you don't try to deal, and this is what we bring as the psychotherapist, the symptom is a tension between remembering something that is vital for us to remember, but forgetting it. So we forget it because fear, there's too much out there. I don't have time. I got to get the mask. I got to get the toilet paper. I got to do this. Yes, of course. But then you're going to be running, running all the time. But what is the fear as a symptom asking you to remember? What are the images in that? What are the larger stories? And you try to work that up so that the person at the personal level feels or finds, or you help them discover 
that the root of the fear is also fed by personal trauma. Maybe that memory services. But the fear is also fed by the cultural historical. We should be afraid, just like we were in the 80s of a nuclear winter. Mm. That's real. And then at the collective archetypal level, stories about uh, fear and and uh, I can't think of one offhand, but all of the, the dramas and the stories about how people respond to fear. You, you know, I remember somebody giving me a dream in which they were being chased by a wild animal and they got so afraid they were running, running and they came in suffering from a, a kind of racing heart. And so I stayed with that and we talked about, you know, does that have any roots in your personal life? But the important point was when we got to the issue of saying, well, who is that dog that is chasing you? What are you being asked to remember? And this was hard to do, but this is hard to do with any fear. Can you stop for a minute, instead of running away, turn around and engage with the dog? Who is that? That's then welcoming in through the side of the symptom what we're being asked to remember. And then maybe we become spokespersons because we discover like Greta Thunberg is teaching us that 14 year old now 15 16 by teaching us to look at what we're losing and what we're destroying and to feel the sorrow I have always found particularly when I worked with adolescents in the 80s in the nuclear issue that beneath the anxiety and the paralysis and the feeling like well why do anything there was deep sorrow. So I try to uncover and help people find the sorrow that lies beneath the fear and the anger. <laughs> Thank you. Got a um, couple of interesting comments. Oh, uh, Joanne, Joe Roden. I noticed that anamnesis also refers to an acute response of the immune system to a previously encountered antigen. So perhaps our collective unforgetting, especially around Black Lives Matter and climate emergency, is an acute response to an antigen. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. I didn't I'll know that. Send it to you. <laughs> Who was that? Who said that? That's Joe, Joe Roden. Um, found that. Could, and there's could Joe send me something about that? I'm sure we can organize that. I will I will ask her to to pass you that on. Um, Vince is saying theatre was originally a religious enactment of the stories of the gods. Do we need a new world religious view that is based on honouring and reviving nature and her suffering? I'd be very careful with that. I think uh, if you go back to psychoanalysis and, and Freud's beginnings of depth psychology, he modelled it on uh, Greek drama. And if, if you read about how Greek drama started, you know, the, they would, the people would march down just as the sun was beginning to rise. And then they would see the drama being performed and the actors would wear a mask where the character would be projected out. And so Freud recovered that. And I think what that teaches me is the whole question, so I'm gonna use a different word, what the shadow of technology in the Frankenstein book is teaching us is the danger of acting as if we are gods and that we are not under the sign of something larger than ourselves that I call the sacred. So I wouldn't use the term that we need a new religion. We need to recover a sense of the sacred. However, we understand that. And what goes with the sacred in the community sense? The sense of ritual. We don't have that anymore. It's been, you know, the ritual of giving thanks at Thanksgiving in America means that you go and you stuff yourself with turkey and you all get drunk and you have political arguments. What about the ritual sense of coming together at community time to celebrate something that is larger than ourselves? Gratitude, Thanksgiving, Christmas, even Halloween. There's something sacred about Halloween, of making a place like Roman Carnival or where the children dress up and give a place. It's our debased version of the Roman carnival, but 
there are still some seeds there about recovering something larger than ourselves, by which I mean the sacred. And because Victor Frankenstein cuts his ties off with nature, and it's the feminine figures who die because of his hubris and acting as if he's a god, the sacred, and I'm trying to make that clear in the book, is carried by the master. He's our god face. Oftentimes, the parts that we isolate, and we call devil, demon, monster, that's where our god face is. That's where the sacred lies. So you see what I'm doing. I'm engaging in this work of inversion, going to the margins, attending to those figures and inverting things. What we would demonize, now we have to regard. Yeah. I don't, I'm just, with what you're saying about the, the sort of the shadows and the inversions, I don't know if you saw it, but the, um, the version of Frankenstein that they staged at the National Theatre the character of the monster and the character of Frankenstein were alternated between the two actors. I saw it on YouTube. Mm. Um, I'm not I sure whose performance I thought was play. best, but it was, yeah. Well, I wrote a one act play based on the book that I wrote. And we, we put it on stage twice and I had Victor Frankenstein wear a mask. And when he returned to the audience, it was the monster's face. So I thought that that was brilliant what they did. Okay. Because Victor Frankenstein has the monster in him that he projects outward. And we all have that. Yeah. And how do we make monsters? We split what we don't like in ourselves, deny that it's there, and find somebody to put it on. Basic, primitive, psychological mechanisms. And if we keep doing that, yeah, it's a disaster. It is a disaster. Thank you. You know, I, I, I sound like an Old Testament prophet sometimes. <laughs> but when I say that, it brings me joy because I think of Blaise Pascal, the 16th century philosopher, mathematician. He said, human beings are only reeds, but we are thinking reeds. And if nature spends all of its energy to destroy us, at least we know we're being destroyed. So we have that capacity in ourselves to really look at things and begin again. That's what we have to wake up. You have to be apostles for that awakening. I guess I am sounding like a... Somebody once said, you sound like Elmer Gantry in that great film. But I believe it. I think we've got work to do and I think it's possible. Thank you very much. Mary, I'm gonna hand back to you to close the proceedings as our community coordinator. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just trying to, un I have done, unmute myself. You wanna put your video back on? Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> I shall do my Monstrous best. Monstrous technology. Yeah, it's monstrous that I can't be seen. So here I go, okay. There you are, good. There you are. So it feels like we've done a great journey with monsters coming at the end of the, the journey we've been on. And I'd like you just to take for a moment the, what you've heard this evening, what you've dismissed, what suddenly touched, and what held. Just take a moment with that. The bits you didn't get, the bits you did get. And just to hear in. Because the monster voice is often rejected, not heard, dismissed, or criticised. And if the monster was limping shyly into your life, or 
all the grand thoughts that we might have had. But if a monster was tapping at your shoulder or your elbow or your head or your heart, what might be the keepsake of this evening? In the Negredo is the beginning. In the thing that needs to be burned to bring through is a something. The symptom, as we heard this evening, my standout moment, the symptom is purely about vocation, a call to bring through. And what if that was real? And to take a moment with that, as we work towards our completion this evening. What if the monster, what we find ugly or misunderstood or not appreciated, is the better thing? And then an invitation to turn on your cameras and be visual again to each other. To come back, blink by blink, camera by camera. Yeah. To be monstrous and subtle. <laughs> and vocated together. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, come on. <sighs> and in this last bit together, maybe to, cl to claim what in the monster needs to gentle or fierce up to dream on, to retire, to take on, to become more, to be embodied. I'm going to ask you all to come back. And in our last couple of minutes, to very much thank Robert for bringing his wisdom and experience and his story, his intelligence and his depth. There are bits that we would add, bits that we haven't included, but he's spread a place where we can go beyond and inquire of each other, what's monstrous and alive among us? Mm. So I'm gonna ask you, because I'm a, also a drama therapist, as being a very committed revision psychotherapist, just to make within your space as lively or as small in a way that you want to, just a gesture from what you've heard. Let your body talk. Last thing, before I do that, five, four, three, two, one, and close the room. No, Nikki, you have to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
I have no control. <laughs> uh, well, I think you can. Um, I think we might have, have we lost Robert? No, I'm right here. Oh, you're there. Sorry, I lost you. That's okay. My signal dropped out. So I lost everybody for a few minutes. But um, so are you asking me to say thank you and good night, Mary? Yes, Nikki. Is that what, it, Go for that's it. what you'd like me to do. Okay. Yeah, why not? <laughs> All right. Robert, thank you very, very much for a really fascinating conversation and um, try to, to listen and think about the monstrous symptoms that call to us. And um, we're really very grateful and appreciative of the time that you've given to us. So thank you very much indeed. And um, I will uh, no, be no. interested in your blogs. Good. What, Mary? Okay, just, just a movement. I'm a drama therapist as well, being a vision uh, person. Just a movement for your monster position. If your monster was allowed to speak embodied, yeah. And just take a glimpse right, ah, 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 ah. And Nikki, close the room whenever you like. <laughs> I will do the same thing. Ah, uh, well, I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, I think that's probably enough monstrousness. Um, <laughs> but, okay, thank you so thank much you again, all. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mary, and thank you to everybody who's participated, and yeah. hopefully see you again soon. Thanks okay. very much. Thank Thanks you. I hope we meet again. Good night. In the flesh, at a pub. With a B. Yay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Goodbye. How do I get out of here? <laughs> Stay, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We need to talk. Bye. 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 Bye.